Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone, everyone is faring well. And uh, welcome to the live stream. Um, we're just going to be starting in a couple of minutes from now. Um, in the meantime, I'm just setting up the last few little bits and pieces. Um, let me see. Everybody's jump, jumping in. I see. Let me know if you're here. Let me know where you're from. Uh, drop us a message in the chat. I'd love to know. Um, you know where you're from uh, and also very curious to know if you've had uh, joined any of the new webinars that uh, we've been running since this week so have you been there maybe yesterday have you been there tomorrow uh, yesterday have you been there on Wednesday maybe um, would love to know that um, we'll be running for about half an hour in terms of content and we will be um, answering any questions during the webinar uh, where I can um, otherwise we will be uh, answering questions at the end of the webinar as well I've got a chat moderator with us which is Tom my colleague he is one of the specialists in the free to nine commercial um, space so any more technical questions he'll be able to answer in the chat straight away uh, when you have them and uh, I will try to answer any questions I can while I'm um, in the webinar Shout out to all the Suhoers that have been joining. Great to see you guys. Um, hope you guys will be uh, getting a lot of information from this, although I think most of you guys will probably know uh, what I'll be talking about uh, today. So I'll just let that run for a few more minutes. I see we've got a lot of people jumping on as we go right now, uh, about 20 at the moment. So again, let me know if you're here, uh, say hello, uh, let us know where you're from. Um, you know, I know yesterday we had some people joining in from overseas. We have people from WA, we have people from Queensland, Victoria. So uh, let me know where you're tuning in from. Always interested to know um, who is on there today. Um, and again, I hope everyone is doing well. Maybe even enjoying a little bit of working from home. It's a bit crazy. Um, I'm myself, I'm in self-isolation because I traveled interstate. So this is as close as I, as I get to social interaction. So please. Uh, uh, let me know something in the chat because I can't even get out of my apartment these days so I can't can't interact with anyone so um, just give me yeah a few more minutes and then we'll we'll get going um, again if you have any questions uh, put them in the chat we've got a chat moderator Tom he will be answering the questions Tom if you are there please uh, flip a message uh, as to our Australia and uh, I've got a bunch of other colleagues on here as well that will be able to answer some questions. If there's anything particular you're curious about already at this moment, and you know that there's something you're coming here today to hopefully find out, also let us know in the chat so that we can um, make sure that we uh, cover that question. So welcome again, we've got about 25 people now here, so really great to see the numbers. Is there anyone who has actually joined yesterday's webinar? I'm curious to hear um, about the residential code. Um, oh, okay. So Vincent, you have been uh, you've been talking to the industry about the code changes, as I can read. Um, it will be interesting to know what your thoughts are on this. Actually, um, it's been quite a a journey for us in the last uh, twelve months to uh, to fully grasp the changes to the code uh, and how that would be uh, impacting um, our business. And I can't probably say with 100% certainty that we have figured everything out, um, in part because much of the tooling that has, uh, hasn't has been released by the government and we have to make it ourselves. Um, thermal bridging and facade calculation. Well, Nat's definitely touching on, um, well, quite briefly on the bridging and what that means and the facade calculation uh, as such. Um, the more detailed questions about thermal bridging, um, Tom will be able to answer. He's in the chat currently as SUO Australia. Um, so if you have any specific questions about that, feel free to answer, uh, ask them and, and Tom will answer them to you. Um, because in this webinar, we're only keeping it nice and short to 30 minutes. So we won't go in too much detail on every single element. We're, we're trying to give you guys an overview of the essence of what's going to happen. And hopefully trigger some of those questions that you might have to um, put in the chat right now. Um, so we'll see how we go. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's get going. Um, we're talking about today about the NCC 19 changes coming up in a week or four from now. Um, and today we're talking specifically about the commercial code or the classes three to nine, um, to be more specifically. 
Um, I'm Warrens, I'm the Sales Innovation Manager at Suho, so I'm not an ESD consultant, so I've just been asked to run through the basics that I've uh, got to learn and was told by uh, the ESD consultants, and Tom is our expert in this field, and he's in the chat to answer any of your questions. If you do um, have any issues with the audio or the video, let me know in the chat, I can read the chat. Um, yesterday, we had a bit of a weird sound at some point, it was like I was working from space instead of working from home, um, so let me know. Um, so that we can try, try and fix it. Otherwise, I've changed the microphone today, so I'm hoping that it will be uh, better. Um, also, be mindful, there's a five, six seconds delay between the chat and the live stream. So if I'm not answering your question straight away, that's because there's a bit of a delay. All right, before uh, we get into uh, the nitty gritty of this code change, I always like to start with when is this going to impact us? Because obviously that's the first question everybody has. Um, because Let's face it, it's been live since May 1, 2019. That's when the code came into play, but we have a grace period of a year, which uh, in theory should be used to get ready for this code change. But in reality, it just means that everybody kept on doing what they're doing and uh, nobody really gave it too much attention in the industry, apart from probably ESD consultants such as ourselves and Vincent who's in the chat. Um, so at this moment, there is few rumors going around that uh, the, the government might maybe prolong the grace period a little bit because of what's going on out there. Um, you know, it's NC19 meeting COVID-19. We're not entirely sure what's going to happen. But at this moment, as of today, there's no signs of anything formal happening in terms of uh, expanding. So as we stand right now, four weeks from now, we are going to have um, going to the NC19 code. Now, what does that mean, May 1? It means officially that when you submit your building permit application on May 1 uh, or later, you officially fall under the NC19 regulation. However, in saying that, that's the theory of it, but in reality, the building survey has a lot of, um, a lot of power in terms of you know, deviating from that on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, in reality, we have already seen a couple of uh, cases where, especially when town planning permit was already um, you know, uh, fixed, uh, that surveys typically will allow you to keep on using the NC16 even after May 1 if you haven't yet uh, submitted your building permits. Uh, in other cases, our first uh, advice and my first tip for this webinar, and perhaps the most important one, is go talk to your building surveyor and get in writing um, that you are allowed to keep on using the NC16 uh, code, um, especially if you've already done a lot of the design work uh, on this side of May 1, and obviously that will be quite difficult to change around. Um, uh, after May 1 with new regulations. So first advice, um, talk to your building surveyor if you're in doubt. Um, otherwise, you know, any project that just came in or is currently coming in or coming in in the coming weeks is definitely going to be using the NC16 code. All right, on that, let's go next. Um, well, normally I just put this in there because I'm not entirely sure about um, everybody in this chat, um, you know, the level of understanding of, of, of some of the terminology that we use. Um, so Section J compliance is basically, um, you know, that's just a, the name of, of the compliance we're trying to get to, uh, to get a building permit to build a house, uh, the building that's been designed. And then there's two different pathways within um, that, that compliance um, umbrella that you can use to get compliance. So they're both uh, allowed, they're both official, and one is called deemed to satisfy or in short DTS and the other one is JV free. Um, DTS doesn't use any modeling, it's just a calculation and because you're not modeling and simulating like you do in JV free, um, the government essentially says okay let's be safe, better safe than sorry, we're gonna just give you quite high specifications all around to make sure that it performs all right. But it also means that you traditionally get high build cost um, because it's not looked at very, you know, uh, custom and, and not really holistically, which is what JV3 does do. Um, and it also allows you to offset certain things. But to give you an idea, we at Suho, we've been around for 15 years, have done over 60,000 ratings. And of those ratings, all the commercial ratings that we've done, 95% have been JV3 as opposed to only 5% DTS. So the JV3 pathway, although it's a bit more expensive from a compliance perspective because you need to model everything, it actually saves a whole lot of money in build costs and that's why this has been so far the preferred method to use. Um, however, moving forward under NC19, that ratio 95.5 might very well change and might very well change quite dramatically. So. Um, 
how this comes to play out, whether it's going to be 80, 20, 70, 30, 50, 50, not entirely sure, but we'll touch on, on the new process and a little bit down the, uh, further down this in this webinar on what um, we are looking for moving forward and, um, around this. So we'll touch on all these little elements in a little bit more detail um, in this webinar, but just to give you a bit of an idea, the four key areas of change, um, the building envelope, not really surprising. You know, every three years we see the code change and it's pretty obvious that when you change the code, you typically up-spec, um, you know, your envelope in terms of your insulation values, your, um, uh, your, your glazing uh, values and so forth. I guess the only important note on the building envelope is the thought behind it. So whereas the previous code was very focused on, on sort of energy efficiency and energy reduction, this code is really focused on carbon, um, the carbon footprint, so in reducing the carbon emissions. And that's obviously have everything to do with the geopolitical stage where we're in currently and Australia signing out to certain goals um, and, you know, not maybe meeting them so well. So, you know, we're basically trying to reduce the amount of energy that we need to pump into buildings to keep them at a comfortable temperature. And the way to do that, obviously, is to make those buildings more passive uh, design so that you need less energy to kind of keep them comfortable. So, um, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense. And we definitely, for, as Suo, think that the code itself is a very a good code, well thought through, but it's certainly still going to have a lot of impact in the market. Lighting and HVAC, you know, there are definitely important features. Um, and we'll touch on that in a little bit more detail. Lighting. You know, which is, uh, has also got a lot of updates in it in terms of um, you know LED becoming the standard as opposed to T8, and the H factor is so important because, like I just said, we're trying to reduce the amount of energy that goes into the building, and H factor obviously plays a massive role in that. So we'll touch a little bit more on that later in the webinar. But maybe the most important change in terms of this bigger uh, picture is the thermal comfort. So the thermal comfort assessment that is quite known by ESD consultants as part of the Green Star assessments, has now been introduced into the code. And if you do JV3, so one of those two pathways, and only JV3, you need to do a thermal comfort assessment. It's a mandatory assessment next to your energy assessment. So that obviously uh, can make a, a huge impact in um, how that's, how your compliance is going to play out and, and what, kind of, what type of specifications you need. Um, and that means that although DTS has been increased in stringency and JV3 has increased in stringency even more, which basically means that gap between the two, which was the 95-5% ratio, um, has been you know closed a little bit. So we're not entirely sure how that's going to play out. All right, so um, a little bit about the DTS and the changes to the DTS uh, code and NAT. This is where we uh, talk a little bit about the thermal bridging. Um, Thermal bridging now, when we do the calculation, has to be taken into consideration. And this is a very tough calculation. In fact, it is that tough that the ABCB um, has contacted us just four or six weeks ago to ask for assistance. Because a lot of the tooling that, um, that needs to be used to get um, compliance is actually not being officially released by the government, uh, such as the facade calculator um, and all this kind of stuff. And, They've asked us how we've done our tooling because we developed it in-house and, and we take thermal bridging into account. Now, what does that mean? I mean, the essence of thermal bridging is probably known by, by most people, um, but the reality is that your insulation is not going to perform as well um, um, as it, you know, just the standard values because of thermal bridging bar, for instance, steel uh, beams. Um, a little bit like this damn wall that we have on the picture, which lets through 10 to 15 percent of the water. Um, that's the same thing that happens in a building. Now, in practice, what does that mean? It means that when you have maybe an R value of 1.3 as your specification that you need, um, after you finish the calculation, you might need actually R2 in, in terms of insulation to meet the actual value because of the thermal bridging. So really what it does is actually um, forces you probably into higher insulation values than you initially get when you get a DTS uh, result. So, now, uh, normally, by the way, I don't have my speakers on. I don't hear myself, so um, it's just what it is right now. I, I'm literally only talking to the camera. I'm not hearing any audio uh, outside of this, uh, this little space. So I'm hoping that this will be um, get better uh, for you. Um, all right, a few other changes on the DTS. Uh, nothing too crazy. Um, and by the way, anybody can replay this, um, this webinar afterwards. It's going to be saved on YouTube. So if you want some of those values, uh, and look at them again, you can, you can open it. 
Um, the roof, our values stay uh, relatively the same, 3.2 for climate zone 6, which is Melbourne, uh, and surprisingly enough, 3.7 in climate zone 5 in Adelaide, which is maybe a bit odd. You would think that maybe the other way around. But again, that uh, has to still take thermal bridging um, into consideration. Um, yeah, Amber, it might be the acoustics in the room. It's, it's a small, tiny studio room here in the apartment, so apologies for that. Um, the lighter roof color is probably the most relevant change that I'd like to mention. Um, previously, you basically could use any roof color you like when you went DTS, um, and the R values would just change accordingly. Under the new code, if you want to do DTS, you need to have a solar absorbance of less than 0 0.45 or equal to it. That means you essentially have five color bond colors left. So that is not a lot of <laughs> options. And if the client or the council is that set on a certain color that is outside of the spectrum, you basically can, can DTS as an option. And that has obviously significant impact if a whole pathway all of a sudden is no longer open to you. When it comes to the floors, look, um, a couple of R values that are not obviously too crazy. Um, but probably worth mentioning that the any building that is roughly around 400 square meter or less is likely to have to go for uh, insula uh, insulation. Um, and obviously, because it's a smaller size project, the budget is smaller. But if you have to charge on another 100 to 200k for uh, that type of insulation, that's going to have a significant impact. So smaller projects commercially, service stations, and the like. Um, you got to be really mindful if you want to do DTS, you're probably looking at installation in the slab. So that's certainly impacting um, some projects out there moving forward. Um, I'm hoping, I'm just trying to talk a little bit less loud, and I'm hoping that maybe the echo will slightly reduce. So let me know if the, if the audio um, goes up or down. Um, the walls, um, the maritime operating buildings, uh, definitely got some increase in the uh, R value requirements. Uh, up to 3.3 in some climate zones. Um, but most importantly, maybe for a lot of people out there that use spandrel panels, they need to be insulated moving forward. And here on the image, you see just two typical um, constructions for external walls that we see, uh, that, we see uh, that we'll be seeing around uh, after the NC19 code. Um, and if you have any more questions around that more technically, feel free to drop them in the chat so that Tom can answer those questions for you. So the key takeaway from the walls is the spandrel panels is probably the most important thing to notice. All right, and this is the facade calculator. And I know that someone, I think it was Nat, asked about this a little bit. And it's a good question, Nat. Why? Because this is probably one of the major differences between 16 and 19 when it comes to DTS in particular. Um, previously, we were running with a glazing calculator as a separate thing. Whereas now, the whole wall and glazing is considered as one system. Which, which I think is a good thing, thing because you need to look at it holistically, but it also makes the calculation quite complex. So the whole system, all the walls have, the whole wall has one R value and has the wall glazing both integrated into each other. So you can no longer go to only your window supplier and get the calculations for your DTS. You're going to have to do the full facade calculator. calculation. The big problem here was that the government has still, at this day, four weeks away from the growth change, not to release the official facade calculator. They've been working on it since, I don't know for how long, and they've asked us for help, but we've had to build one internally. And I know there's, um, I think Darren O'Day made one, and that's online, um, but there's really very little um, um, know-how outside um, of, of uh, Darren O'Day and, and Suho, I think, in terms of facade calculations. Um, and that's kind of, um, you know, disturbing, four weeks away from the code. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, Speckles is, 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 is a tool that's online right now. We have our in-house uh, in facade calculator, but outside of that, I don't think there's really any specialized easy consultancy uh, seats that have their own facade calculators. Um, but yeah, so definitely maybe not a great look for the government that uh, so close to the code change that haven't actually released it. Um, Vincent, if you know anything about if the government is going to still release it before May 1, we'd love to know because we have not heard anything about it actually happening. Um, you do have two methods now when you do the facade calculation. Uh, you've got one that's per orientation, you get your value, uh, or you can get one value for all uh, four orientations around. And I've took an, uh, a few examples with me for this webinar that shows you a little bit what I mean when I talk about these two different methods. But the key for this, uh, like it was before, but now even more so, is the glazing to all ratio. Um, and that's 
the next, next slide, slide just to illustrate you guys a little bit what that means. But the blue line that you see here is the NC16 gold, and the orange line is the 19 gold. Now, what you can see is that when you talk about 2025, up to 30% blazing to facade ratio, both goals will be relatively similar. You can get away with pretty straightforward single blazing. And when you're looking at 60% though, which, you know, especially office buildings and, and stuff like that, um, you see that there's a very significant push for um, getting that double glazing, even in the firmly broken triple glazing systems, if you really want to have a very, you know, glass box essentially. Um, so, um, very important to notice that at the early stage, as an architect, um, you know, to be mindful of what that percentage might look like, it's going to give you a bit of an idea where you might be sitting in terms of um, in terms of values that you need to use for your glazing. Um, so that's, that's something that just is, is very, very key. The same goes for the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, I know it's not technically the tint, but for the people out there that are not easy consultants, I'd like to say it's the tint of the glazing, the darker, uh, and, you know, the lower the, the SHTC value. Now, as you can see in this diagram, it doesn't look like much of the difference, but a, a 0.1 difference is quite significant. And 0.26 is about as dark as it gets right now. For instance, Melbourne, one of the most, uh, one of the new buildings in the center of Melbourne, has 0.26. Um, as you can see, if you want to do 60% or even above, you're already looking at that type of solid heat gain coefficient for your glazing. So if you find really want that clear glazing um, and doesn't like tint, and you might run into a bit, a bit of trouble uh, with DTS. So uh, just a few, uh, two examples that I brought along. Um, nothing too detailed to go into, but just to give you a little bit of an idea uh, on how um, how the differences might be between 16 and 19. So on the 16, this particular building would get away with pretty straightforward uh, values for the roofs and the walls. Um, and then you would have a, a pretty straightforward single glazing on all different orientations and a sort of heat gain coefficient that is pretty much clear. Um, under the 19 codes, um, we can actually see that with method one, which offers uh, north, east, and south, uh, you know, the R, the U value went down by, by three points. Um, and in method two, uh, we get a pretty nice number of 5.3 all around. So in this particular project, probably in method two we should go to. Now, the 1.4, however, in the walls is bridged, meaning, like I said before, Effectively, in practice, you might be looking at you know R two or something like that, depending on the construction. So it does it isn't quite as uh, as nice as it might look like. Now, just another example. This is a class three welcome house. Um, here again, you see the values values being quite dramatically lower than under NC sixteen. So sixteen could get away with um, you know a four. Point, um, four point something on the, in the glazing, which is, you know, probably close to a uh, you know, nice double glazing system or a really good uh, single glazing uh, system. Um, under the 19 code, that, that goes well below the four value. And here, all of a sudden, you see that method two um, forces you to a U value of 3.1 all around. So here, you actually could consider method uh, uh, one being the better uh, method to use. I see that there's a little typo in, in the in the slide. That should be method one, not method two. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. If you assess it up front, um, we can get a bit of an understanding or you know what, what method will work better for your project. And what you're looking at right now is what we like to call the pre preliminary DTS check. And that preliminary DTS check is basically um, done at concept design stage. And it only takes a couple of hours, which means that it's also only a couple hundred bucks. So in that concept design stage, you can already get a pretty good baseline in terms of the specifications that you're looking at for your project, for the roof, the wall, the glazing and the floors. What that does, it allows you to go and look at those numbers and see, hey, are these acceptable for me and my clients? If they are acceptable as a baseline, you're happy to go, um, uh, you know, happy to move forward. And then you can always still approach JV3 as an option down the track if you feel like you want to explore better, uh, uh, even, uh, you know, better specifications uh, or other specifications than you currently got using DTS. Alternatively, if the DTS options are unacceptable and way out, then that probably means that your design needs rethinking or some changes in the design need to be made, which we can also 
um, assist with. We've got a design studio that is specialized um, with building designers and architects specialized in optimizing designs um, uh, to meet compliance. So we can help adjust the design, rerun the, the DTS check and see if we can get those numbers a little bit more uh, up to the level where the client likes them. Nat, I'm happy to hear that the audio just got better and um, not entirely sure. Uh, Matt, um, uh, I see your questions about the SHTC graph. Uh, the orientation is probably listed uh, in that page. Uh, maybe Tom, you can have a look at the uh, presentation and uh, answer that question. Um, here we go. Now let's have a look at the JV Free pathway. And what is probably the most important uh, thing to know about that pathway is that firmware comfort assessment that's now required. Now, firmware comfort is based on ASHRAE, and ASHRAE is a standard that's been around internationally for quite a few years. It's quite well known and well developed. It's a complex formula that takes um, all these little factors in, into consideration, which you see on the right on this slide, and um, is also used already in GreenStar. In GreenStar, you will need minus 0 0.5 or plus 0 0.5 to get your points. Um, under the current code, it's been just introduced, so they don't go quite as stringent as the Green Star because that's best practice. Um, but instead, you need to have minus one and plus one. But you will need it for 98% of the operational time. Now, what does that mean in the diagram that you see below? You're essentially looking at having about 80% of the people feeling comfortable in each room of the building. So each room is assessed separately. And we make, uh, depending also on uh, what type of room it is and what type of activity is happening there, um, you need to score between those two numbers. Again, firmware comfort assessment um, can be quite new for some people. Uh, we've uh, also developed in-house a firmware comfort assessment tool uh, to make sure that we can run this properly um, under the NC19 code. So in addition to the firmware comfort assessment tool, it's probably also worth noting that when you do run into a Neighbors or Green Star project, um, or you're running one, so Neighbors for Office Buildings or Green Star, um, JV Free is, is not a, a requirement anymore, so you can use Neighbors or Green Star as respectively JV, JV1 and JV2 to do your uh, compliance. You will need to do on paper officially thermal comfort, but in essence that, that should be pretty cruisy because, as I said before, the thermal comfort is already in the Green Star and has a higher standard than the, the thermal comfort of the NCC. And neighbors, if you if you're going to a certain, you know, typically a pretty decent level of neighbors, formal comfort should not hurt you too much. Um, in addition, you know, we see that in JV3 we've primarily got a lot of updates around, you know, the uh, occupancy profiles and all that. So we also saw that some of the temperatures have changed that they're looking at that you need to achieve. So that I think was 18 to 24 degrees. Now it's 21 to 24 degrees. So they've just like tightened everything up a little bit and made it more, um, um, you know, just a little bit more stringent. So this slide, I'm not gonna stay on too long. I just wanted to put it in there for those who are rewatching it. It's a little summary um, on the different little elements and then the difference between DTS and JV3. Um, um, but more importantly, um, let's just look at, at HVAC and, and, and light for just a second. Um, just to give you an idea, HVAC section, the J5, um, has doubled in size. That probably just illustrates how um, you know how significant this is as a part of that carbon emission reduction. Um, and I guess the key takeaway around HVAC is that now we need more detailed information about HVAC earlier on in the process because of the thermal comfort assessment. Um, and yes, Vincent, I have actually just talked to a client of ours that uh, did a neighbors project in Melbourne that are going uh, to use JV1 as the standard uh, way to go. And we've also just got a project going on in Queensland that is using um, both GreenStar and Neighbors, and uh, we'll just use that as the compliance methods. Um, anyway, so HVAC, uh, probably like a lot earlier in the stage, we need to know a lot more details about, um, you know, the type of HVAC you're gonna be using, um, uh, and, and, what, uh, and, and that is probably something new compared to what that used to be. So that's just something that needs to be um, the people inside of the project, the stakeholders need to be mindful of uh, from an early stage that probably that HVAC design and, and the consultants on that in that space need to get on board a little bit earlier so you can do your um, assessment properly. Lighting, like I said before, um, I mean, it's not really going to impact you guys in practice too much. Um, it still used to be T8 as a standard in the 16 code and I couldn't imagine anyone still using T8 these day and age. Um, so the standard has become LED, 
Um, so that shouldn't be really much of an issue. Um, it does have a, a significant reduction of the lighting allowances for the Synod offers, which was uh, 4.5 watts per square meter now, of, uh, now, and it used to be nine. So just something around lighting design and the use of light has just been, again, tightened up to make it a little bit more better suited to nowadays. Um, but other than that, I don't think that this is going to impact you too much um, under the new code. What is going to potentially impact you, and that's why I thought it was interesting to just to mention it. We've been talking about section J of the code today, but section F has natural, da natural daylight in it, and daylight factor analysis now becomes mandatory in, in multiple classes, and three to nine are the most notable classes that it will impact. And what that means is that you, if you go JV3, imagine this, you're doing JV3 for your energy, you're doing thermal comfort assessment, and now you've got a third element, a nice little triangle, daylight analysis. As you can imagine, that might potentially conflict with each other because daylight likes clear glazing, potentially, whereas your energy wants to maybe have tinted glazing. So all of a sudden you're having to balance these different factors with each other. So that's just something to be mindful of. You might be cruising with your JV3 and thermal comfort assessment and your daylight might still throw in a little curveball and, um, and create some issues. So, Again, something to be mindful of and uh, to make sure that uh, that happens. Um, air infiltration, just an interesting note. Um, you know, air tightness testing has been introduced as an option now to, um, to do after you finish the build and prove that you've built your, um, as, uh, you know, properly sealed your building. But it's only an option. You can also still get away with ticking the boxes saying that you've weather stripped and sealed everything. Um, so in reality, we're probably still going to see air tightness testing only really at Green Star. Um, but we are expecting this to be an introduction. So three years from now, we think that air tightness testing is something that's going to get more prominent in the code. All right, to finalize, uh, because we're running close to the 30 minute mark. Um, this is how the compliance pathway is roughly going to look like moving forward. Um, our advice is that in concept stage um, to now run a DTS check. As I said before, that's going to give you a baseline of your specifications in multiple angles with quite detailed numbers. It's nice and cheap. Um, we don't need a lot of information and a lot of details to do it. And it can also be easily rerun if you do change your design in schematic or design development phase. It's just a good idea to not wait to build a permanent gun ESD consultant on board because they might come back to you and say, listen, your design simply isn't going to cut it. Um, and you know, we all know that if you have to go back to the client and say, uh, you know, design you really liked and that you now were, you know, uh, running your whole project on, we've got to have to change that around. So we're trying to prevent those surprises down the track. Um, so we're making sure that in that early stage, we can do a DTS check. In addition, we have the new service developed, which is called the NCC Compliance Consultancy, uh, which also allows us not to only do a DTS check, but to actually look at the design and flag any potential elements that might cause trouble down the track. We've got our building designers and our ESD consultants look at it combined and making sure that whatever you come up with, make sure that you check it um, in an early stage to make sure that you're not running into any um, problems down the track. Are you happy with those DTS results straight away? And it might very well be the case. Um, you can just keep on running in the DTS route and just get a final DTS report. Um, otherwise, you can still um, explore the JV3 route um, or if you're really dissatisfied with your DTS results and you can't get your design to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, really get your satisfactory results in DTS, or you have a, a dark roof color that you need to use, then you can use the JV3 method as well. So how it's going to play out the ratio, not entirely sure, but we definitely um, will see um, that DTS is going to become uh, far more used than it currently uh, is. So key takeaway. General stringency increase across the whole board. Um, take on board in council design um, some advice from an ESD consultant. That can obviously be Suho. Uh, we're well on top of this, but there's definitely some other players out there in the market that also know their stuff. So that's good to see. Um, the ratio is going to change between the use of JB3 and DTS. And in the previously in the previous code, you were basically going straight for JB3. Now on the new code, it's really important at the council design stage to explore what route it's going to be that you'll be using as opposed to fi figuring that out at building permit stage. Um, so, and make sure you talk to your building surveyor for any project that's currently in your books and that you're working on um, to make sure that um, um, you, know, you don't get any surprises down the track. Um, otherwise, so these are the webinar series for this week. So not very relevant because you guys have chipped into the 
uh, final one of this week. But next week we'll be running four more webinars. Each day there's going to be one. Um, I know that the air timeless testing one is going to be run next Thursday, so that's going to be a really interesting one. On Monday I'll be running uh, this presentation, but also including residential changes, so it's a combination uh, webinar. And on Tuesday I'll be running another one just on NCC 19 residential changes. So if there's any colleagues uh, or people in the industry you think that might be helped by getting a bit of this information, um, you know, go to our LinkedIn page, go to our YouTube, subscribe there. Uh, the website, um, the new program for next week will be posted up today. So uh, keep an eye open for the times and the dates. And the commercial change webinar that I ran today, as it is, will be rerun again next week, Wednesday. All right, that is it for uh, today on this webinar. I hope it was useful. Um, if you do have any more questions, feel free to fire away. I saw a lot of uh, action going on in the chat. Uh, sorry if I wouldn't, wasn't able to uh, follow everything uh, live, but I've tried my best. Um, I see we've got well over 40 people joining today, so that's really exciting. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope to see you guys back uh, for some more webinars next week. And then we'll add some really interesting other webinars the weeks after as well. Um, some are, for instance, uh, Hubble, which is a piece of software that's going to predict star ratings using an artificial intelligence algorithm. We've developed that in-house. We're gonna have a webinar uh, about a 10-star home that we designed. So how do you design actually a 10-star home? So it's gonna be a lot of interesting uh, stuff on our webinar series. Um, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. Antonio, glad you enjoyed it. I think I've seen your name in some other webinars uh, this week. So uh, great to see you uh, back here. I um, hope it was informative. Um, also very curious, Nat, you asked me before if you were particularly interested about thermal bridging and facade calculation. I know I've only touched on it a little bit. I hope that was helpful. Uh, if you do have any more questions, feel free to um, uh, chat to uh, Tom at Suho Australia or to send us an email at info at suho.com.au. Happy to answer all of your questions. And uh, Vincent, happy for, uh, thank you for sharing also your thoughts and, and knowledge on this topic in the chat. Uh, always really cool around uh, code change. is always so important to um, you know, engage as an industry with each other and make sure that we're ultimately going to be able to help the construction industry, especially in these tough times and when we're going to uh, be out of it and having to pick uh, things back up, I think there's a real need for good ESD consultants that are going to help these uh, people to run forward. Um, yeah, I, I guess Nat, you know, you need to explore the detail on that thought a little bit more. I'm, I get it, especially on that thermal bridging. Um, it is complex, you know, otherwise the ABCB wouldn't come to us to ask how we did the calculation. Uh, but like I said, send an email to info at or um, give us a call and ask for Tom. Um, he will be able to help you out with some more details if that's helpful. Um, Shiva is asking about a session regarding detailed modeling and compliance for commercial building. Um, if you're talking about how to do design builder, for instance, and how to model um, I think that's definitely something that we are looking at running a webinar on um, and to explain sort of how the actual compliance is done for commercial buildings. It's a great idea, Shiva, and we'll make sure that we um, discuss that with our uh, commercial team. Um, I, for one, think that's a really interesting one. Um, any more questions at this stage? Then feel free. Like I said, there's five sec uh, six seconds delay, so um, I won't be able to uh, jump on it straight away. I hope everybody is, is, is staying safe. I hope everybody is um, going to enjoy the weekend. It's a bit strange when you go from your home into your home for weekend, but I, I hope everybody can still switch off and, and enjoy that a bit of uh, bit of weekend. I'm going to have to stay uh, in, in house the whole weekend because I'm not allowed to go out. Um, but I hope uh, for most of you guys there will be an opportunity to go out there and go into the nature and uh, just enjoy this, this time out, this global time out, as I'd like to call it. I see slowly some pe the people are starting to uh, get out of the webinar, which is obviously fine. Have yourself a great Friday. Um, you know, uh, let's wrap up this, this is probably for most first or a second uh, working from home week. Uh, for me, it's been very actually busy and very hectic. So uh, I'm sure it's been the same for you guys. So um, enjoy that last couple of hours to work and, and, and a good weekend. Thank you for coming uh, today and uh, hope to see you guys again in one of the webinars in the coming weeks. We'll be running them for uh, at least another six, seven weeks. Um, and obviously feel free to invite anyone 
um, to the webinars that you think might be helped by them. And finally, obviously, hit the follow button, hit the subscribe button on um, LinkedIn or YouTube so that you can keep track of all the interesting new webinars that we have. With that, I'm going to say goodbye, have a great day, and thank you again for joining today, and see you again soon. Bye.